1989 and for the leader from 1989 to 1995. After an appointment as a distinguished professor of physical chemistry at ETH Surrey from 1993 to 1994, he assumed the distinguished chair in physical chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego, from 1995 to 1998. In 1997, he was named Robert Burns Woodward Distinguished Professor at Harvard University. His research group moved to Stanford University in 1998, where he became professor of chemistry. Then Harry S. Mosha professor in 2003, and professor by courtesy of applied physics 2005. Professor Morner was appointed department chair for chemistry from 2011 to 2014, and his current areas of research and interest include. Single molecule spectroscopy and super resolution microscopy, physical chemistry, chemical physics, biophysics, nanoparticle trapping, nanophotonics, photorefractive polymers, and spectral holborn. Therefore, we are very honored to have you here in the Mexican Optics and Photonics Meeting Special Edition 2015 to Professor William Warner. the honor and the privilege to be able to come here and speak today. It's a, a wonderful thing for me. Um, I want to particularly thank the organizers, Horacio, uh, Amalia, and Eric, uh, for their hospitality. Uh, thanks also to MOPM and uh, all of the other supporting societies for this wonderful honor. And of course, the support from the OSA is particularly important to me. Uh, and I want to send my warmest congratulations to CIO uh, on this uh, 35th anniversary. Congratulations to you. So I'm going to talk about uh, single molecules and this whole story of how light paved the way. Uh, and so in order to do that, I'd like to start by giving you a, a quick, if you like, uh, roadmap of what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief historical overview, uh, because I'm sure that there may be some younger people in the audience that may not know about the very early days of how single molecules were detected. And it's a beautiful story of light and spectroscopy. Uh, and so that's why it's very important for us to sort of enjoy that uh, old, old iteration today because it led the way to what happened after. So this was really talking about how, to, it, how do you use light to, to detect a single molecule. And then I want to talk about how you can surpass the optical diffraction limit using uh, single molecules and fluorescence and control of the molecules, even blinking of the molecules. Those of you that have your uh, lanyards, you know, blinking and so forth, it's going to play a little bit later in my talk. And I'll talk then, finally at the end, about new optical methods, uh, really uh, taking apart the light coming from the single molecule to learn more information about the system. So, so let's go back and let's get started uh, to the mid-1980s. Think about the mid-1980s. That was a great time when light and optics were being used to detect single ions, for example, uh, in vacuum traps. Uh, there were STM looking at atoms on the surface. There were many experiments studying single quantum systems. But what about molecules? Uh, could you detect a single molecule? Well, there was a problem, you see. Uh, at that time, uh, this great physicist, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, said that we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. Uh, and so on, he, he comments about this particular idea. And of course, this, uh, this shows you the danger of predicting that something cannot be done, right? <laughs> But at the same time, uh, there were many others who thought this uh, wasn't possible. Uh, and so the really important thing to describe is to, to explain to you how I got to the point to believe that it was possible. 
And that requires us to go back and look at high resolution spectroscopy in solids at low temperatures. Uh, if you take a molecule, let's say like this terylene molecule, and put it in a transparent host, you know that there's going to be an optical absorption. It's going to have a certain color. And at room temperature, if you measure the spectrum, you get broad lines. But at low temperature, this is now cooled to about 2 degrees Kelvin, the lowest electronic transition actually has four different origins. That's because there's four different equivalent sites in the crystal. The, the absorption line became so narrow that you could not, uh, that the, then you could see the difference in some of these dramatically different local environments. Now, uh, with higher resolution, uh, here in 79, there's this spectrum of the two lowest uh, site origin transitions of penicene and paratrophenol from uh, Zoeo. And that's uh, a line that has a width in the frequency domain of about one, centimeter, one inverse centimeter, one wave number. And you might ask yourself, well, is, is that all there is? Is this the end? Is this how narrow molecules will be when they absorb light? Of course, you didn't, you, you hoped not, really, because the excited state is very long-lived. And so this transition should have been more like 10 megahertz in width when you've cooled the low temperatures and got rid of all phonons. So uh, there a number of people were exploring ways to look inside this line. It turns out that absorption line is what's called an inhomogeneously broad line. The line itself is a profile, but there are many narrow transitions that are coming from the homogeneous widths of the molecules, and they, but they spread over a range of center frequencies because the different local environments in the solid provide different strains and stresses that push the molecules to different places. Now at that time, I was at IBM Research, and we were studying these zero phonon lines uh, and, and uh, this inhomogeneous broadening effect because there was a potential application. People wanted to look inside the inhomogeneous line, and so you might do photon echoes or other things. But another way to look inside the inhomogeneous line is to do spectral hole burning. Now that's a method that takes an inhomogeneously broadened line, like the ones that I'm showing you, uh, but then you use a narrow band single frequency laser to pump only a small subset of the molecules, one homogeneous width of them, then if they change, if they go to some other frequencies, uh, another position in frequency space, if there's photochemistry, or if there's a change in the local environment, the molecules move away, leaving a dip behind. That's what a spectral hole is, that dip, a spectral hole. And at IBM, we were exploring this idea for something called frequency domain optical storage, writing bits in the frequency domain, just by tuning the color of the laser to put different bits at different colors. So uh, it's a beautiful idea, and there was a, it was a wonderful time at this uh, large research center. Uh, this was one of the corporate research centers in the, in the United States, like Bell Laboratories, where you could explore science and not only do a technological application, but also ask deep questions, ask hard questions about the idea. And here's the question that was interesting to me. What are the ultimate limits to frequency domain optical storage uh, by whole brain? Um, one particular limit that you might ask about is there some spectral roughness on this inhomogeneous line that results from statistical number fluctuations or the discreteness of the individual molecules that are contributing to the absorption? In other words, this transition that I showed you here, is it a smooth profile? Or if you look on the very, very highest resolution scale with very, very high sensitivity, do you see something different? And that's, in fact, the experiment we set out to do with, this was with Tom Carter at that time, my postdoc, penicillin and paracrypental with low temperatures, we spread out the inhomogeneous line to make it be very, very broad, look at only a small piece of frequency space at very high resolution, about one megahertz resolution, and what do we see? This. It's amazing structure. The, uh, there seems to be a spectral roughness on the inhomogeneously broad line. It's been spread out so much that it looks horizontal on this scale. And if you measure it once and then measure it again, you see exactly the same structure. This is not noise. Okay? This is coming from that statistical number fluctuation effect that I mentioned, and it had not been observed before, this work in 1987. So it's significant for several reasons. First of all, the uh, total absorption scales at linearly as the number of molecules in resonance within one homogeneous width. Scales is n. You know that. The absorption scales linearly with the number of, of molecules you have. But this signal, this what we call statistical fine structure, uh, its RMS amplitude scales as the square root of the number of molecules in resonance. It's a really interesting spectral feature. Its amplitude scales as the square root of the number of molecules. We detected this using FM spectroscopy, uh, a method that measures the differences in the absorption profile over a certain 
finite distance range. So what's important about it is that it directly arises from the discreteness of the individual molecules, and it also uh, showed that the single molecule limit was, in, was within reach. Let me explain why. I mean, this, this experiment uh, was using about a thousand molecules per homogeneous width. So if there's a thousand molecules contributing to the total absorption, then this, S, this statistical fine structure, it, its amplitude is about uh, the square root of a thousand, or about 32. And so once we can detect this signal, the single molecule limit is only 32 times away. It's only 32 times harder to get to the single molecule limit. Okay? So that's, that's the good thing, right? You want to have something that scales not linearly, but is, is a, a sublinear power, then you have a better chance of getting to it without working as hard. So this is why we pushed on with FM spectroscopy. And in uh, 1989, Wotar Kador and I using uh, FM spectroscopy with some secondary modulation, some star modulation or some ultrasonic modulation for, for technical reasons, uh, detected single molecules in this experiment. It's using FM uh, that was invented by Gary Bjorklin, uh, also at IBM, uh, and the experiment did something important. It showed us that pentacene and paracophenyl would be an important model system to get started. Uh, the method was limited by laser shot noise, Okay? It was a transmission method, but it was limited by shot noise. Uh, that means we didn't care about scattering. We didn't care about the quality of the crystal or the sample. It was just a chunk that had been cut with a razor blade. Uh, and so it was an important beginning. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, the signal noise ratio was not as high as we would have liked. That's because you cannot turn up the laser power in this experiment enough to reduce shot noise a lot more, relatively, because then uh, you will broaden the spectral feature. You don't want to broaden them because the amplitude will go down. So uh, we were limited in the power that we could put on the detector in this experiment. But it's very much like FM radio at 506 terahertz. The molecule converts at an FM modulated light beam, frequency modulated light beam, uh, into amplitude modulation that you can detect with your detector. So, um, now, what happened after that, a year later, a very important step occurred. Uh, uh, Michel Aurie in, in France used also penicillin and paracrephenyl, and he decided to detect the absorption a different way, detected by looking at the emitted fluorescence. Uh, all, uh, and so here's the, uh, some of the original data. These are the inhomogeneously broadened lines again, and the single molecules are these little tiny dots, if you can see them. Uh, this method, of course, is sensitive to scattering from the sample because any scattering of Roman backgrounds also looks like emission or fluorescence. That uh, you have to make sure that's small, but you can do that, making excellent samples, excellent crystals. And this method also had higher signal to noise in the same bandwidth. So, what was uh, the major thing that happened then, because of this crucially important experiment by uh, Michel Larry, who uh, in fact, I sometimes often like to say that if there had been a fourth person recognized for the Nobel Prize, it would have been Michel. Uh, it, it, was, it caused the field to switch and use this fluorescence excitation method uh, after that. So here's some of the things that happened at low temperatures. It's actually really useful to look back and see uh, some of the things that we were able to do here with my uh, student, Pat Ambrose. Here's the fluorescence signal as you scan a tunable laser over the inhomogeneously brought on line. And all of these peaks are the fine structure, first of all. But if you expand the scale, you see there's individual isolated Lorentzians. And on the megahertz scale, you see just one, uh, whose width was about 7.6 megahertz. 7.6 megahertz at a center frequency of optical frequencies, 506 terahertz. Really a beautiful, extremely narrow spectral feature and, and incredibly useful for spectroscopy. You could perturb it by electric fields and many other interesting sort of perturbations. But very quickly, we started doing imaging of these molecules. Uh, that is, uh, using one axis on this plot to be the frequency of the laser, and the other axis to be moving the laser spot across the sample, very much like a confocal microscope. Uh, and so these little mountains are, are molecules. And we uh, knew at that time, well, this is sort of interesting, in the spatial domain, we're actually using the single molecule, a, a nanometer-sized object, to measure the shape of the laser spot. Right? Because at every position where you have the molecule, it's looking at the local electric field from the laser spot. So you get the shape of the laser beam, uh, scanning the molecule over. Uh, and very quickly, this became two-dimensional microscopy and first built lab and, and reverse contrast. But <clears throat> one of the exciting things about all this uh, <clears throat> new regime that was, that was beginning to be explored uh, in our lab and also all over the world was that we were, we had, were looking somewhere where no one had looked before. 
Uh, and the, you can imagine that under those conditions, there might be some real surprises that would appear. So here's some of the surprises. Uh, this, this is going to show you a bunch of spectra, okay, a repetitively scanning the laser of a molecule. But look what's happening. This molecule is jumping all over the place. The molecule's moving from one frequency to another. And when uh, Pat saw this, he came running into the office and he said, the molecules are jumping. What's going on? <laughs> this is at 1.8 degrees Kelvin in a crystal. Okay. So you weren't really expecting that, but it turns out it's happening because the nearby host is changing. There are two level systems in the nearby host and defects that can undergo tunneling transition to those changes in strain fields. And uh, there is like Jim Skinner helped us to understand this effect. So if you let the, if you sit the laser at one frequency, then you see that the molecule will jump into resonance and you'll get signal and then jump out of the resonance. And, and so the signal could be just blinking up and down. You know, it's turning on and off, on and off as the molecule jumps into and out of the resonance with a fixed frequency laser. So that's the blinking, the first blinking that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, <clears throat> next, uh, another experiment, Thomas Bachet. He, he was looking this time at for a different system, perylene and polyethylene. And here I'm scanning. He's scanning one molecule again and again and again. And then after this scan, he brought the laser, just like this little pointer, into resonance with that molecule. Just bring the frequency right to the, tip, to the molecule. And the signal's there for a while, and then it goes away. And then he quickly went back and scanned, and he saw, oh, uh, it's gone. The molecule moved somewhere. It moved way off the screen. It moved far to one in frequency space, to the left or right. And then he actually went out for a, for a smoke, believe it or not, <laughs> and, and came back. And he looked at the spectrum again, and the molecule was back. <laughs> so uh, this actually turned out to be a reversible process. You could drive the molecule away, it will come back. Drive the molecule away, it will come back. And we could measure the kinetics of the process. So this was the beginning of optical control of the molecules. <clears throat> Uh, be because this other effect over here was spontaneous, coming from even the few phonons that are left at 2 degrees Kelvin. So the, the whole area of single molecule studies exploded uh, after that in the early 90s, low temperature spectroscopy. But then there was also major efforts to move to room temperature. And I just want to just interrupt for just a brief moment to remind everyone why we are doing these kinds of experiments. We're removing ensemble averaging. We don't have to measure billions of molecules at the same time. We can just get an average value for all those molecules. And you can measure a parameter molecule by molecule and see whether there is heterogeneity, see whether they are in different local environments, see whether they're in different internal states, see whether there's time dependence, and so on. And you can also use the molecules because they're extremely small, only a nanometer or so in size, a few nanometers. That means that the molecules are a reporter of the local environment. It's a reporter of the local fields can be used for distance measurements, and that's one of the things that's important for super-resolution imaging. I'll talk about it in a minute. You can even sequence DNA with molecules and so on. So now let's switch to room temperature, and uh, I, I want to sort of just remind everyone how the experiments are now done at room temperature. Uh, but first, mentioning some of these pioneers in the room temperature arena, uh, especially uh, Dick Kelly. In, in 1990, his group observed the light uh, from a single molecule as a burst as it flew through the focus of a laser beam. Uh, I mentioned Dick because he passed away just a, about a week ago. And so uh, he was a great pioneer in this field and we'll all miss him very much. Uh, near field methods were used. Then after that, uh, confocal methods, light field methods, total internal reflection methods, all kinds of microscopies turned out to be useful for detecting single molecules. And uh, at room temperature, we're basically pumping molecules from a ground state to an electronic excited state. After some relaxation, we're collecting the emitted photons uh, that terminate on vibrational levels of the ground state. And this cycle uh, goes on uh, many times, so you can detect many photons from a molecule before finally photo bleaching occurs, which we'll talk about in a moment. You also uh, pick molecules that don't go into dark states very much, although we'll, that can be used as well. So now at, at room temperature, a new field was opened up, a new world to look at biology, to look at living systems, to look at uh, crystals and polymers and all kinds of other configurations, not just at low temperature. And uh, illustrating those kinds of experiments here in a schematic way, you might think of focusing the laser down to the smallest spot you can, you can use, you can make, uh, limited by diffraction. So it's visible, that's about a few hundred nanometers. Uh, and in order to get to the single molecule limit at room temperature then, you have to dilute the molecules. You have to make them be far apart, farther apart than the size of this focal spot. Uh, that's so that only one molecule is pumped, and the light you detect is coming from that, only that molecule. 
Okay, so at room temperature now, uh, another set of fascinating things have, have, were occurring, and I just want to say that even though super resolution is the, the topic of the Nobel Prize, just watching single molecules without super resolution is very powerful, and uh, I'm going to illustrate a couple of very quick things that you can see uh, without super resolution, just by looking at single molecules. For example, in cells here, uh, here's a cell, and you can see an outline of it, and I'm going to start this movie. Uh, this turns out to be an important cell in our membranes, uh, a protein in our membranes, and you can see the light from this single protein, but look what they're doing. Now at room temperature, they're dancing all over the place. They're moving around. They're, they're uh, moving on the surface of the cell. This is happening on the surface of our cells right now in our bodies all the time. Um, and this is uh, information that you could, you could get from the motion of the molecules, diffusion processes, whether uh, cholesterol is effectiveness, and so on. Another very quick example, I'm not going to talk about the biology here in a bacterium. Uh, this single molecule behaves very differently. Watch near the dot. You'll see that single molecule <clears throat> move in a line. It moves across the cell in a line, uh, across the cell in a line, and then turns and goes around the back side of the cell, also in a line. And this is actually time-lapse microscopy, so it's quite a long time period. The molecule is really undergoing directed motion. It's totally different from this diffusion process I just showed you earlier. That's coming from other interesting biology. And even in materials, let's say crystals at room temperature or polymers at room temperature, <coughs> here's some single molecules of terylene and a crystal of paraterophenol. Uh, but watch the movie. There, there's two classes of molecules. A bunch of the molecules are fixed. They're not moving. They're in good parts of the crystal. The others, are strangely, are moving. They're in the cracks of the crystal. These molecules are stable enough at room temperature that they will move around. And you can image them for a long time. This is bias diffusion, not random diffusion and another process that you can learn by looking at single molecules. Finally, another example from this uh, room temperature single molecule decade, okay, in the 1990s. This is from 1997, uh, Rob Dixon in my lab. Uh, we wanted to look at single copies of green fluorescent protein. Uh, Roger Chin and others had invented green fluorescent proteins, and he was also at San Diego, so we could get samples from Roger of a particular mutant, mutant called yellow fluorescent protein, or enhanced yellow fluorescent protein. Um, and uh, this particular, um, what does that say? 10 that minutes. Says, that says 10? I'm supposed to have an hour. <laughs> so uh, I've only been talking for 20 minutes. I don't have an hour? Yes. yes. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this timer says 20 minutes. <laughs> OK, um, so yellow fluorescent protein. Uh, can we see single copies of yellow fluorescent protein? Because it's really uh, it was revolutionizing biology. Uh, you can tell the cell to make yellow fluorescent protein as a label attached to the protein of interest. Uh, so yes, of course, we can see single copies. We say now, uh, here's an image of single copies of yellow fluorescent protein. But we, we uh, saw some really interesting surprises as well. Now at room temperature. First of all, blinking. We, we saw that the single copy would emit, 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 and these are successive frames of the camera, and then turn off, and then after some time later, turn back on again, turn off, turn on again, and so on. Uh, this process is something like uh, we're cycling on, uh, on this uh, emissive transition, and then the molecule goes into a dark state, presumably by isomerization of the chromophore. The chromophore GFP is hidden inside this barrel. It's protected from the outside, but it's hidden inside this barrel. And if, and if it changes, then you can uh, go into a state where it is not fluorescent. But then you can come back from that state and start emitting again. So uh, that was the blinking process, but that's not all. We also saw that if you irradiate for a long time, then you can make the molecule stop blinking and appear to just quit completely. You might think it's photobleach. But a little bit of blue light would rescue the molecule and bring it back to the emissive state. So here's a molecule that's that you irradiate for a long time, turn off, give it a little blue light, and then turn on the green again, and you can see fluorescence, uh, use it up, turn it on again, etc. So we were able to use light to restore the, the uh, fluorescence that had turned off from single copies of yellow fluorescent protein. So this led to the further development of switchable fluorescent proteins, such as photoactivatable GFP, uh, Adronica, and many, many others. A whole uh, raft of experts have developed and um, improved uh, switchable fluorescent proteins. And those will play later as we talk about super resolution, which I want to begin now. So <clears throat> this Nobel Prize, of course, uh, rec uh, recognized Eric Betzig, Stefan Helm, and myself 
And I want to describe a little bit about uh, how you can think about all this work. Here's a, a simple demonstration. Uh, it's, it's too simple for you who are all experts. But uh, I just want to you know, show it because it's still kind of fun. Uh, this is a bacterium. Uh, and bacteria are small. There are only a few microns in length, and they be 500 nanometers across. Uh, and inside this bacterium, we've used fluorescent proteins to label specific, uh, specific proteins of interest. Okay? So here's the fluorescence, but you can't see very much, so you might think, well, I want to see what the structure is. What structure are those molecules making? So you buy the most expensive microscope you can, right? <laughs> there it is, the most expensive microscope you can. You don't see any structure. <clears throat> wow, why is that? Everything looks fuzzy. Well, in fact, that's because even though the emitter itself is only about 3 nanometers in size, uh, the diffraction limit uh, recognized by Ovid uh, in the late 1800s uh, makes that small emitter appear as if it's much larger, a few hundred nanometers in size. And this is Ovid's diffraction limit equation, of the wavelength of light you're using divided by 2 times the numerical aperture of the microscope. The numerical aperture is about 1, uh, it can't be much larger than 1. And uh, so this causes uh, point sources to look large, uh, and it's all coming from diffraction, coming from the way of nature of light. <clears throat> and that, of course, has plagued optical microscopy since the beginning. Uh, it's always been a problem, uh, and just because it's such a fundamental physical effect. And so the, the uh, new work that we call super resolution means using methods to go beyond the diffraction limit to produce a new kind of image, not this one, but this kind of image which is just incredibly different, as you can see. There's so much more information uh, in this super-resolution image as opposed to this diffraction-limited image that uh, that's why people are excited. It's, it's not a small effect. It's not a 10% improvement. It's more like a factor of five improvement beyond the diffraction limit. And you see so much more. Okay, so uh, super-resolution microscopy actually comes in several flavors. There are some approaches that do not require single molecule. And one of them is stimulated emission depletion microscopy, invented by Stefan Hell. Uh, and it's a beautiful idea, uh, uh, but I won't describe it unless one, someone wants to ask about it. Uh, structured illumination microscopy also goes beyond the diffraction limit. Uh, that, that's a work by Mads Gustafson. Uh, <clears throat> but my part of the story uh, connects to methods that do require single molecule imaging, uh, which makes it very related to the work of Eric, Eric Betsy. So uh, you might ask then, how do we use single molecule labels to surpass this fundamental diffraction limit? Uh, the answer is, well, first you have to image single molecules, you have to be able to do that, and then second you need two additional key ideas. And to make sure no one is confused, my, my last contribution is really on the foundations uh, of these areas, like the photo control and so on. Um, so how do you circumvent the diffraction limit? That, that's the point, really. We, we're not going to you know, uh, make it be an untrue physical effect because it's a physical law. We're going to circumvent it in a certain way. Here's the key ingredients. First of all, I said you have to image single molecules. But that's well known now, right? That had been done back in 1990. It started uh, in our lab. Uh, here's one of those early images. Here's a room temperature image. Those single molecules look like little discs in this uh, two-dimensional microscopic image. Of course, they're, they're not... Um, uh, they're, they're not just simple round discs. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use something that I like to call super localization to find the positions of these molecules. So first of all, you blow up the image, you expand the image on the camera so that you uh, cover multiple pixels of the camera. And in one dimensional cross section, you see that uh, there are different numbers of photons that land in the different pixels. This spot has a shape, which is called the point spread function of the microscope. Approximately, uh, and its probability distribution for where the photons land on the, on the camera. Uh, it, it is an airy function, uh, formally, but a good approximation to an airy function is a Gaussian function. The idea is we've sampled the shape by using different pixels of the detector. So we can use those samples to fit to a model function, for example, the Gaussian. The width of this Gaussian has to be diffraction limited, okay, because we haven't broken any uh, physical laws here. But the parameter in the fit that corresponds to the center position of that Gaussian is something that I can know much better than the diffraction limit. In fact, the error distribution for finding the center position is, is much narrower. We call this, uh, the, the standard deviation of this distribution, sigma, or, or the localization precision. Uh, and the localization precision scales 
as the Abe diffraction limit divided by the square root of the number of, of photons that are detected. The number of photons that are collected by the camera. Because each photon is actually a measurement, uh, a measurement of the position of the molecule. So it's uh, like having n measurements. That means then, uh, if you can detect 10 to the fourth photons in this whole image, then you could have from 200 nanometers down to 2 nanometer precision for localizing the molecule. Okay, so that's superlocalization, and it's not a new idea in science. It's not a new idea for Nobel Prize. It's been around in, uh, using astronomy. Even Heisenberg mentioned this uh, in terms of uh, detecting the position of an electron, like scattering photons off of it. Uh, and it works great if you have separated single molecules. <coughs> uh, but what about the fact of looking at a structure, of achieving true resolution, to getting the shape of a structure with resolution, or distinguishing closely spaced molecules that are much closer to the diffraction level? So that's the key uh, idea number two, which I like to describe as active control of the emitting concentration and sequential imaging. I like to describe it in this general way because the idea itself is, is very deep and very general. It requires having molecules that have, in effect, two states. Uh, one state where the molecule is bright and fluorescent, that's the one we normally think about. But there also have to be dark states of the molecule, where the molecule, even though it might be pumped by light or, or might have reading radiation present, it does not produce fluorescence. And there's a bunch of ways to achieve that. I'll talk about some more in a moment. But think of molecules that are switchable like this. If you have that, then what you can do uh, is achieve super resolution in the following way. Suppose you label the structure with many molecules, okay? Uh, so that's the structure with the labels. They're all dark. And the problem, of course, occurs if you uh, allow all of them to emit at the same time. If you, just, if you just turn on the light and have all of them emitting at once, then you get this, this blurry, fuzzy image that's limited by the diffraction. Uh, so you see the solution now. You simply don't let them emit all at the same time. Uh, for example, suppose they're dark at the beginning and they're photoactivatable. Suppose that you use light to convert from this dark state to an emissive state. Then you can do that with dim control light and only turn on only a few. If you have only a few on, then you read their positions, okay, by illuminating and measuring their positions, like, like I said, the super localization. Uh, photo bleach them, and then do it again. Uh, you can then, uh, next time you illuminate and turn on another subset, uh, you'll get a different group, of course. This is a random sampling process. And if you do this many, many times, you'll get many positions that you can put back together in a reconstruction of the underlying uh, structure. In other words, it's a pointillist light reconstruction from pointillist art. If you remember that at the time during uh, the history of art. Uh, and we uh, really reconstruct the underlying structure by the positions of the single molecules that were found. So it's a sequential process. That is, it's a time sequential process. This takes a little time. It's very much like time domain multiplexing. We're extracting information about the positions at different times. And uh, this beautiful idea. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I first heard about uh, from Eric Betzig uh, in April 2006 when he gave a talk at the NIH and described uh, what he called POLM at that time. Uh, that was uh, Iraq acronym photoactivated localization microscopy. Uh, <clears throat> he was using photoactivation at the beginning. But as I say, the idea is just so general. It's not just photoactivation. Very quickly after that, uh, Storm appeared from Schwann, uh, F. Palm from Hess. And then there was a whole uh, flood of additional acronyms, paint, uh, D-Storm, uh, GSDEM, Blink, SOFI. Uh, all of these acronyms are different ways of, of, of uh, producing this active control mechanism. Uh, for example, STORM started out being switching molecules on and off by using two different fluorophores and controlling them with different light beams. Uh, paint I'll is another scheme that involves binding of molecules, and if they bind, they turn on. If they're not bound, they, they are off or they're dark, and so on. Um, we did something called YFP reactivation uh, very quickly after this, using those YFP switching business that I told you about already. Uh, but we didn't uh, produce any, any acronym for that one, right? So, of course, it's forgotten, right, <laughs> if you don't have the acronym. So, to mitigate that, then uh, I'll produce another acronym here that's mechanism independent, single molecule active control microscopy, or SMAP. Okay? <laughs> So and just, that's just a joke, of course. I mean, uh, but what, my point here is that uh, you want to think of this as, as a generalized idea. Of course, you as an experimenter have to pick which active control scheme you want to use. That's why I like to call it active control. 
you as an experimenter must control the number of emitters and make it be small, and then you're able to do this kind of experiment. Okay, so uh, I'll give you some quick examples. Uh, going back to the, uh, the YFP and the blinking idea, so here now you can, you can really begin to see some of this blinking business that I was talking about earlier, that you have on, on your lanyards. This is uh, Colobacter crescentis cells, a particular bacterium we've been studying with a collaborator at Stanford. White light image. Remember, they're all quite small. This bar is only a, a, a five microns. And um, on this side, I'm showing the fluorescence, the camera image of a light coming from these cells. Uh, if you run the movie, then you see this fantastic blinking, right? This is the essential raw data for these kinds of experiments. Uh, every one of these blinking events are coming from molecules that are inside the cell that I'm showing on the lab. Uh, and they represent information about the positions of the single molecule. Uh, so you, uh, for every frame in the movie, you find the positions of all the molecules, and then you reconstruct to get the, the uh, full uh, super-resolution uh, image of the sample. So uh, using that idea, here's three different proteins in bacteria. Uh, they have these funny names, MREB, PARA, HU, don't worry about the biology details. These are the diffraction-limited images, which don't show you very much. Right, because bacteria are small, they're kind of close to the diffraction limit already. You really need some scheme. Uh, to see more. When you do soap resolution, then you see this. So the, what's exciting, of course, is, wow, right? There's so much more information, so much more detail <coughs> available now. Let's see, what did I do with my water? Here. I have a little water. And uh, now it's, it's like a veil has been lifted uh, on what's going on inside these little, these little organisms. This particular structure is a little bit helical. This is a long linear structure that is involved with the separation of the chromosome. The, this particular protein, HU, binds to DNA nonspecifically. So these positions light up where the DNA is. And you can really see clearly that the whole cell is filled with DNA in these bacteria. So the, uh, the exciting thing that happened then, after the beginning of these uh, single molecule super resolution methods, a uh, variety of people started applying them at many, many different regimes. I don't have time to describe all of them. There's beautiful science in many, many labs all over the world. I do want to just talk about one particular application because it goes deeper into the broader arena of real implications of these kinds of experiments for, for medical problems, specifically Huntington protein aggregates. So you may have heard of Huntington's disease. It's one of these horrible brain-wasting diseases that uh, can occur uh, in people with particular mutation. And the uh, disease occurs because the hunting 10 protein, uh, when it has a large number of glutamines, okay, a poly-Q or polyglutamine sequence, it has many, many glutamines in a sequence, more than 40 in a sequence, then uh, all different sorts of things start to happen. And the hunting 10 protein starts aggregating and forming fibrils that are found in the brains of people that have Huntington's disease. So we want to understand this uh, process of the formation of these fibrils uh, based on uh, and using super resolution. So here's some quick examples. In a model cell that's a neuronal-like cell, we take the Huntington protein and uh, a version of it that has 97 uh, glutamines in the sequence and label it with YFP, yellow fluorescent protein. And then the cell will make the labeled Huntington protein uh, we then use the blinking and super resolution that I just talked about to see what the structure looks like. So here's a, a, a cell, uh, and if you see two things. First of all, you see these huge, uh, they're called inclusion bodies. Uh, conventional microscopy, almost every biological experiment that's normally done on Huntington's disease only sees these, these uh, inclusion bodies. You see a bright inclusion body, that's all you know. But with super resolution, you see that outside the inclusion bodies, there's a huge number of very tiny uh, little uh, aggregates that are, that are below the diffraction limit, uh, uh, and they're all over the cell. You can follow them as a function of time. Even in a neuronal-like, uh, an axonal-like projection, okay, this, this particular cell line is like a neuron, so it forms an axon. Uh, you can see uh, uh, regions of fluorescence that in, this, in the diffraction limited image, Here's a, one of them, the fraction limited, but super resolution shows that these are fibrils that are a couple of microns long and maybe 100 nanometers in diameter. 
So uh, we're, we're excited about the, uh, the applications of these super-resolution <coughs> microscopies to uh, amyloid forming diseases. Now, let's uh, switch gears completely away from uh, biology and medicine for a moment and talk about optics. Because I'd like to you know, take advantage of the fact that there are, ex many of you, experts here uh, about optics and microscopy and show you some other things that we can do with single molecules uh, <clears throat> and super-resolution. So, first of all, reminding everyone that the conventional fluorescence microscope has a clear pupil. That is, uh, here's the schematic components in a microscope, uh, the object emitting light, the light is collected by an objective, uh, here's the pupil plane, a tube lens then forms a real image on the camera or the detector. And these microscopes are, character, are characterized by this circular pupil. That's why the point spread function is an airy function, okay? But look what happens if you move up and down in Z. If I move the object along the axial direction of the microscope, because what we want to do, first of all, is start getting three-dimensional information, not 2D images. We're going to use optics to get 3D. Well, the problem uh, with this standard point spread function is that as you move the object up and down below the focal plane, you see that the spot, of course, it comes into focus in one location, but then it, uh, it gets larger and blurs out very quickly above and below focus. So this particular response is pretty useless for determining the Z position of the molecule. We get X and Y very well, but not Z. So one way to deal with this uh, is to uh, use a, a, a modification of the microscope to not have a clear pupil. Uh, and that's what we've been doing to create new point spread functions. For example, one of them is called the double helix point spread function. The double helix point spread function is characterized by having a phase pattern, a transmissive phase pattern in the pupil plane that looks like this weird pattern. But if, when you do that, you get two spots. That is, a single emitter gives you two spots on the detector. So this is the point spread function of the microscope. And more importantly, as you move the object up and down in Z, so move the object up and down, the single emitter, then these two spots revolve around one another. So that if a, if a molecule is in a, a specific position, let's say that position, then we use the line between those two uh, lobes of the point spread function to determine what the Z position is from a calibration term. So this encodes Z into a two-dimensional image. And this idea, of, uh, uh, we, we explored this in collaboration with uh, Raphael Piston at the University of Colorado. Uh, now, how do you really change the microscope to make this work? Uh, the, what you do is to use uh, something very powerful, uh, so-called uh, 4F optical processing, well known to me in the optics community. We don't have to change the microscope at all. We have standard illumination, wide field illumination, uniform illumination. Uh, uh, in an inverted microscope, we collect the fluorescence. Here's the tube lens. Here's where the normal image is normally found. To, to make a 4F optical processing system, we just add some optical components and move, move the detector back. And what's in the box, of course, is just a pair of lenses, uh, and uh, it's all spaced by the focal length of these lenses. This optical configuration produces the Fourier transform uh, of the image at this location, and it's conjugate to the back, uh, back focal plane, or the pupil plane of the microscope. So we bring it outside the microscope, so we can easily put optical components in, at this location, transmissive phase mass or reflective phase mass. Then after the second Fourier transform, you go back to real space. So there, there's the mathematical operation for, for this uh, 4F optical processing. Uh, and the, this phase pattern then is something that you can use as a design parameter. In, in our experiments, uh, we've been, uh, for some of them, we use a spatial light modulator, a liquid crystal spatial light modulator, to, to change the phase of the light. But these liquid crystal devices only work for one polarization. And we don't want to throw away the other polarization because every photon counts in single molecule experiments. So when we use the SLM, we like to use this interesting optical arrangement to, to save all of the photons. So let me walk you through. Here's our image plane, okay, that I just showed you, the first Fourier transform lens. We follow that by polarizing beam splitter. So there's now two, two beams. Then we reflect those beams off of a pyramidal mirror, a mirror shaped like the beautiful pyramids in Mexico. Uh, and so what happens then is that the light goes up, and you put the SLM above this mirror, looking downwards. The light then reflects off this uh, reflected SLM, hits the other side of the, of the pyramid, and then comes out. And you can then uh, bring both of these beams to, to uh, uh, image on the, the, the EMCCD camera. 
Okay? So this particular scheme uh, properly rotates the polarization of the vented light so that uh, in the plane of the SLM, both beams have the same polarization uh, that can be modulated by the pattern that you load onto the SLM. Okay, so doing this uh, experiment for the double helix point spread function, just to show you what the data really looked like, here's one of the images of one frame of the camera. Uh, here are, are fits of the positions of those molecules. We fit double Gaussians. Uh, and then the next frame, of course, the molecules are blinking. This is uh, one of the cases where we've used a, a blinking fluorophore, a blinking label to, to, uh, to get the data. Uh, next frame and many all the frames. You can, of course, see, by the way, that the angles of these different double helices are slightly different because the molecules are at different Z positions. You can see that directly with your eyes. Then when you reconstruct that, you get this uh, beautiful three-dimensional super-resolution reconstruction. Uh, the, the 2D, the fraction-limited image, doesn't show you nearly as much. We've colored Z here with a color bar. Uh, so in many locations now, you, you see more detail and, and resolve many, many features. Uh, that's uh, a cell that has microtubules. The image here is of microtubules. Going back to the bacteria, uh, all of these ideas for three dimensions and, and can also be done in multiple colors. So here we use two different colors, one color to label the surface of the molecule, uh, of, the, of the bacteria, and another um, color to label a specific protein structure inside the bacteria. So we're, we're, uh, there's, there's, uh, this is one of many ways to get three dimensions. Now, let me tell you about some more interesting optical problems. So hopefully everyone is you know, still awake. This is going to be a little more complicated, all right? But it's really fascinating. We're interested in making sure that everything we do these molecules is, is not only precise in the statistical sense, but also accurate, that we have the right number for the positions of the molecules. Uh, so let me talk about a, a problem that needs to be addressed. And here's a microscope again. I'm showing you the pupil. Uh, here's the, the uh, object, the objective, pupil plane, tube, tube, tube lens, and the image plane. If you have a single molecule emitting, it turns out, of course, it's not a point source. It's an oscillated dipole. And so a dipole emission, uh, here's, a, here's a little arrow showing the dipole direction. The emission from a dipole is a torus or a donut that it expands to, to the far field. So this particular pattern means that more light goes through one side of the microscope than through the other. And this little ellipsoid shows you uh, near the camera plane uh, where the light is, is, is uh, concentrated. Okay? It's, it's an ellipsoid. Uh, in fact, our image, the image that we show on the camera, is a slice. It's the intersection between this ellipsoid and the plane of the camera. Okay? So now, look at what happens. <clears throat> uh, it turns out if you look at the back focal plane, because more light is going through one side of the microscope or the other, the pattern is asymmetric in the back focal plane. The intensity of light, if you were to detect it here, is asymmetric. Uh, comparing that with an isotropic emitter, which is symmetric. Okay, so this is a single molecule. This might be a point source. Well, now what? So what's the problem here? The problem is if a molecule moves above and below the focal plane, like you do in three-dimensional experiments, look what happens. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you a different orientation. That orientation has a different pattern, so don't worry. Now let's move up and down, below the, below the focal plane. So watch the molecule's going to move, and watch over here. You'll see this ellipsoid. The molecule moves in Z. The ellipsoid moves in Z, right? And now the intersection of this ellipsoid with the detector plane has shifted. It's in a different X, Y position. It's moved away. There is a lateral shift. Specifically, this lateral shift can be serious. There are apparent lateral shifts that occur for dipole emitters that are a function of Z position, and these can be up to 70 nanometers or more for 200 nanometers of defocus. So, of course, that's a problem, right? Because we're trying to provide images that, are, that have much, much higher resolution. The ones I showed you earlier were resolutions of about 40 nanometers, maybe five times better than the fraction. So how do we address this? And my group has been working on this extensively over the past few years. We have three solutions, and they're all wonderful bits of optics. One solution is, well, simply measure the orientation of the single molecule. If you measure that orientation, if you measure theta and phi, then you could calculate and work out what the shift might be and remove it mathematically. And we decided to do that with the double helix itself, with the DHPSF itself. That's because these two lobes of the double helix pattern represent an interference pattern of light coming from the molecule. And so the light going through different parts of the, of the uh, microscope corresponds to a low asymmetry in the double helix imaging. 
the two lobes are not equally bright. Here's the expolarized light at different Zs, for different Zs of the molecule moving up and down. And you can see there's a lobe asymmetry in addition to the rotation. In the other polarization, there's a slightly different behavior, also lobe asymmetry. So what we do in our experiments then is to measure Z from the two end, from the rotation angle, the linear dichroism, the standard linear dichroism, the difference between the two uh, total powers in the two different polarization directions, and the low asymmetry. Then we use a lookup table to infer theta and phi. Then we calculate what the shift would be and remove the shift. So for example, this is an X Y set of images all collapsed together of one molecule that's been moved up and down in Z. And as you move it up and down in Z you get different XY positions. So these are all the different XY positions you get. That's, of course, the problem. But when you, when you do our correction procedure, you can collapse all of those positions onto uh, a much, much smaller area that's limited only by the, the photon, uh, the, the photon uh, detection error, the number of photons detected. <clears throat> so that's one solution, OK? You can measure the orientation, remove it. Another solution, uh, make the label be wobbly and have rotational mobility. This is like a chemistry solution. The, the label is attached to a 4-4 by a linker. And if that linker is very floppy, then the molecule's dipole will flop all over the place while you're imaging it. And so if you do, so now I'm again showing you these, these ellipsoids. This is, uh, we, we decided to study this as a function of the cone angle. Uh, the cone angle of that wobbling of the floor four is, is the parameter that we use for, for simulations here. If the cone angle is small, like 10 degrees, and you get a big tilt of the ellipsoid, and you get different x positions for this single molecule for different z. So you can see the shifts with your eyes. But if you make the cone angle larger, let's say 60 degrees, then the, the ellipsoid becomes more vertical, uh, and now the shift is far smaller, and you can quantify these shifts uh, easily. Uh, these are for, for different cone angles. You can see that the shifts can be large. Uh, here for a 45 degree oriented molecule, uh, uh, sorry, for, uh, this is showing that uh, for theta, for the tilt of the molecule, uh, the problem is worse around 30 degrees to 20 to 30 degrees tilt, theta, the, the polar angle. All right, so that's solution two, uh, make the four force floppy. And the third one, uh, by the way, this is generally true uh, for a lot of cases with people that do antibody labeling, the antibody tether of the four four to the antibody is somewhat long, and so you, you, you get pretty reasonable mobility. A final solution that's a really brilliant one that came up, that was produced by my student, uh, Matthew Liu, is to say, well, wait a minute, we can get rid of all of this asymmetry by just using an azimuthal polarization filter in the back focal plane. So this requires some, some, a lot of mathematics to fully understand, but basically, if you can imagine an azimuthal polarization filter, uh, then uh, the shifted molecule becomes an unshifted molecule. The BSF is slightly changed in its shape, but it's not shifted. It's not shifted in the X and Y plane. So uh, that's, uh, that's a uh, most recent solution of this time. Okay, uh, now um, uh, I have just a few more moments, a few more minutes. And uh, what I thought I would do is to, to, just to say is that there's even more things you can do with the back focal plane and phase processing. That's uh, not just for getting Z, for, for getting the position of the molecules in the Z direction. You can also learn about the orientation of the molecules directly in a, in a very powerful way. So this is a different phase mask that was produced by my student, Adam, Adam Backer. This phase mask, we call it the quadrated mask. Think of the back focal plane being break, broken into four quadrants, and in each quadrant you place a linear phase ramp, a linear phase ramp. So if you remember your Fourier transforms, a linear phase ramp in the Fourier domain is going to produce a displacement in real space. So what this is doing is taking the light that's present in each quadrant and displacing it. So now the spot from a single molecule will be four spots. Okay? And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. Basically, this is taking advantage of the fact that there is an asymmetry in that back focal plane that I already described. The, the di differently oriented dipoles will have differently different amounts of light in the different quadrants. So we want to bring that information out into real space so we can see it. So here's some real space images in two polarizations of single molecules. Uh, each one of the single molecule uh, is not a spot anymore, but it's a set of four spots. Here's five, four spots in one polarization, four spots in the other polarization. Now what good is this? Well, it, you, it turns out now all you have to do is to measure the number of photons in each one of these eight boxes. You measure eight scalars. You don't have to do any complicated fitting. 
you just measure eight scalars, eight numbers, because uh, those eight numbers then can be used in a simple calculation to deduce, using maximum likelihood, what the theta and phi of the four four are. Here's a, here's a single molecule and another single molecule, different orientations determining theta and phi. So let me just summarize this in a different way to make sure everybody understands. In parallel, for all molecules at the same time, we did one phase modulation, which made every image of those molecules tell us what their orientation is. It's a beautiful thing. Because the light that's going through the back focal plane is from all the molecules. They're all overlapping. You don't want to detect in the back focal plane. It'd be hard to detect, and they're all overlapped, right? But if you do something intelligent in the back focal plane, you can bring information out into real space, and in this case, uh, orientation of molecules. Uh, okay, so now students don't stop there. They're going crazy with phase masks. Here's a, here's a bisected phase mask, which gives you this pattern for different Zs, two spots that move apart. They don't rotate. Here's a corkscrew. Corkscrew is one half of the double helix. Double helix, you know, this has two spots, but this is just a spiral. So it can also be used. Uh, and the most recent work, Joab Schechtman, and my new postdoc, has been doing mathematical design of, of uh, PSFs by computational optimization. He basically optimizes the Fisher information and the point spread function for particular parameters. So for example, if you want to get a PSF that works over three microns, here's a, a saddle point mask that works over three microns. Here's a tetrapod mask that works over 20 microns. 20 microns. So this is really quite amazing. This, this particular point spread function makes a series of spots, uh, a series of images that will tell you what the x, y, and z position is of a molecule over 20 microns in z. Remember, the conventional microscope is only in focus over about 500 nanometers. Uh, but all of these new point spread functions give you information over a huge range. Uh, this is some real data from this uh, tetrapod mask, and, uh, or cat mask, we also call it. The molecule is, this is just a bead diffusing in water. And you can see it moving in x and y, and the PSS changing. Uh, so you fit each one of these PSFs. And you can get the, the x, y, and z position. So here's a track of the x, y, and z position over a huge range. OK, well, this whole uh, talk has described single molecules and super resolution and many things. But I just want to make it clear that the, 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 the impact of this work in this area by many, many people all over the world, many talented scientists, has, has impacted chemistry and physics and biology. And I want to acknowledge all those people who are making contributions to the field. I uh, haven't mentioned so many of them. There's this beautiful work on Acton Vans by Shaoli Zhuang and other things. Uh, I want to thank my uh, past students, postdocs, uh, collaborators, and uh, here's the current group of students. Uh, we call our, we're being very serious at this moment, we're ready for Halloween. Uh, I want to thank the agencies for the support of this work. Uh, we have a, a little uh, a logo that we use a lot. That's the No Ensemble Averaging logo for single molecules. Uh, oh, and by the way, I call them the guacamole team. Guacamole. Of course, guacamole. One molecule is one guacamole. Right? <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can take a couple of questions. If you raise your hand, we can give you the microphone. Okay. Uh, how, uh, how long will it take to acquire the images? I beg your pardon? How long will it, will it take to acquire the images? How long does it take to acquire the images? Okay, so it's a great question. Uh, it varies depending upon the system. Uh, in uh, a number of the cases that I showed you with, with the bacteria, it takes some minutes to acquire the images. So th this method of super uh, resolution requires that the spots not move, that the molecules of interest, the structure, be a static structure and not changing uh, on, on that kind of a time scale. Okay? So you want to think of uh, single molecules as being useful in two regimes. If there's a totally static structure, then you can work to get super resolution. If the molecules are all moving around, then you may as well go to low concentration and track the molecules and measure the tracks of the molecules and get your, your biology from the motions of the molecules. Um, now, some people have tried to push this to much higher speed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, sorry, the 
group of your viewers work, for example, using SCMOS cameras, very fast imaging, higher intensity. See, all, all, what you really need to do is to make the molecules blink faster. You want to control the time in the dark state so that they blink more quickly. And that's the way to go to higher and higher speed. Thank you, Zer. Please, if you can give the microphone. Please, please wait for the microphone to run. So that's what I mean by this answer to this last question. Uh, you, you, you really should only apply it to a static structure, a structure that's not moving. Uh, microtubules are not moving very quickly, for example. So if, you, if, 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 if the object of interest is moving very, very quickly, then it's not easy to get super, uh, super resolution. You can, uh, with stead microscopy in certain situations, if you can tolerate the intensities and so forth of stead, you can look at some things with reasonable speeds even at video frame rates. There's another question I think of you like. Right there, there's one. <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you think that the new forms of polarization can be uh, helpful in order to improve the, the microscopy technique? Well, uh, these experiments that I've described are based mostly on a wide field experiments. They're not near field. You could do a lot of exciting things in the near field with, uh, with light and patterns of light, special patterns of light. But these are, these are white people because we're interested in looking at many at the same time. So we have, we're sort of limited to uh, several, you know, circular polarization states, linear polarization states, and so forth, as a beautiful radial polarization state. And, and I mentioned one of the you know, particular ways you can use that as a beautiful to help remove any, any shifts, type of new shifts of molecules. Uh, but the reason that, you know, you can imagine Pumping polarizations and modulating the pumping polarizations. That, that's been done for a long time in single molecule experiments. And it can give you information about orientations of molecules. Orientation plus super resolution is something that several people have already done and we're also doing. Yeah. There's another question in the back of the room. Yeah, I have a more question. Hey, have you obtained the super resolution in manipulating the face mask? Uh, like Atikon, Sarnik, polynomial. So, uh, well, we do things, uh, we do all kinds of manipulations, as I showed, and the ways in which we're uh, parameterizing the back focal plane or parameterizing the focal plane, sorry, the uh, Fourier plane, uh, involve using gauss lagarde polynomials uh, of all sorts with different summations and so forth. That's what the double helix is, is the superposition of many gauss lagarde modes. Uh, the other newer work uh, is mostly based on Jernicke modes. So the, uh, the uh, tetrapod, for example, is a very is in summations of um, particular Zernicke modes found by this computational optimization method. And the last question? Yeah, hi. Uh, the question goes more to the proteins of the GFPs. Like, uh, you describe a little bit about the blinking. Uh, what is the mechanism of the blinking on there? And if there's new YFPs, GFPs now developing, um, what is the photophysics? that uh, need to be improved in order to get, uh, get a better super resolution imaging. Yeah. So the uh, precise mechanism for why the, the YFP blink, the best that we know now, comes from certain uh, calculations about the different conformations that are available to the GFP chromophore. Uh, cis trans isomerization is the most likely that turns off the molecule and turns it back on again. Uh, but remember that these are quite complex local environments. There's many, many hydrogen bonds. There's all of these protein residues that are all around the chrome core. So when people make new fluorescent um, proteins that are switchable, what they try to do is to optimize how many times they switch. In fact, the earlier work was uh, based on uh, reducing fatigue because they wanted to use these molecules to store bits. Ronbob was developed to, to be able to switch many, many, many times. So you want you have many parameters that are important. What's the probability of going into this state? What's the probability of staying in the dark state? All of those things control the blinking dynamics. 
because the bottom line is, out of all of those rate equations, you want to make sure that only a few are emitting at any given time. The, the other thing that we need in fluorescent proteins to make them better is more photons. So uh, if they only produce usually about 10 to the fifth photons before photobleaching, whereas small dyes can give you a, a, a million or more. And so small dyes are better than fluorescent proteins in terms of their, their light output and their ultimate localization precision. Uh, and so it would be nice to have other ways that you can genetically label that, that give more photons. Well, thank you again, Professor Murner. Uh, it is my great pleasure to present Professor Murner this uh, acknowledgement. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please accept this uh, present oh. from oh my God. Mexican Optics and Photonics meeting. Oh, oh beautiful. Oh, what a one. So, thank you all for attending this first session of the Mexican Optics and Photonics meeting. We can now go to the first coffee break. I would only like you to let you know that we are having a conference photograph used after the first session of plenary talks, which will end...